What do I want? Uh, what do I want? I want... I want to be Italian. You know what I'd really like? <laughs> Is to have my weekends back again. Well, I probably... probably want what everybody else wants. What does everybody want? I want to win. I want, I want to do good work. I want my boss to notice that I do good work. I want to be able to work out of my house. I want to design the next Russian flag. I want it to be a Paisley thing. I want things done right the first time. I guess I want a promotion. I want to put piano. I want a big allowance. I want me on computer. So what I really want to do is just to have people see my ideas and so they understand what's going on with my imagination. Meet my quotas. I want to beat my quotas. I want it to be. I want 20 years back. I want my hair back. I want my back back. I want to work less and accomplish more. I want to live fast. I really want to spend more time with the people I love. I don't ever want to sell out. I want to be my own boss. I want my, uh, I want my freedom. Here's to the things you want to your dreams, to the things that are worth working for. Never forget, given the right tools, people can do extraordinary things. The 60s, in the dawn of information processing. Mini skirts and granny glasses were in fashion. The music was vintage Beatles and electric typewriters and photocopy machines were making it easier than ever before to put more documents on the desks of busy executives everywhere. Then came the 70s, pantsuits, gas lines, and the microchip, and new exciting breakthroughs in office technology. Memory typewriters, word processors, and more sophisticated copiers provided better, faster, and cheaper ways of getting more and more information to the desktop the 80s, the decade of leveraged buyouts, Reeboks, working mothers, and the Macintosh. In offices everywhere, Macs, PCs, and laser printers transformed business communication, making it easier, more effective, and even cheaper to produce ideas on paper. Today, in the 90s, all of us are inundated with more paper-based information than ever before. In fact, the challenge is no longer creating documents it's getting them noticed.
Hi, I'm Michael Hopwood, product manager for two new laser writers designed to produce documents that demand the reader's attention. LaserWriter 2F and 2G are the next generation printers that replace the NT and NTX in our LaserWriter product line. These two new printers represent the greatest leap forward in print quality since the original LaserWriter. It's easy to recognize an effective document. It's the one that breaks through all the clutter, allowing the author to communicate succinctly with the reader. The tools to create such a document exist today. Scanners, scalable fonts, graphical computers, but the ability to produce an effective document on paper has been difficult for all but the professional document publishers. Here's why. First, the quality available from mainstream products just isn't good enough. Second, these products are difficult to configure and connect to a network. And third, it simply takes too long to get the right results. Here at Apple, we're out to change all that. Along with the one scanner, we're providing two new laser printers, the LaserWriter 2F and 2G, that will revolutionize the way business documents are produced. In designing these printers, we had three goals. First, deliver the highest print quality possible. Second, provide ease of connectivity. And third, offer superior performance. The LaserWriter 2F provides substantially greater functionality and performance than the NTX at a more affordable price. The LaserWriter 2G is a new class of printer offering breakthrough quality Ethernet connectivity, and even higher performance than the 2F. Let's look at how we've achieved these remarkable results. Our breakthrough print quality is a result of two new and very special technologies. The first of these is fine print smoothing, which simulates high resolution by smoothing text and lines to improve the appearance of both. Our fine print technology is built into an ASIC that finds the edges in black and white text and graphics calculates the ideal edge, and then changes the size of the dots to more accurately represent the ideal. The result is crisper, sharper, and smoother looking documents. While improving the quality of text and lines is important, there's a whole world of images, scanned, computer generated, film, video, clip art, and more that today's laser printers simply can't process with adequate quality. To solve this problem, Apple has developed a revolutionary technology called Photograde. Photograde is designed specifically for images. It provides seven times more gray shades than standard desktop laser printers. This increase in gray shades allows us to double the screen from 53 lines per inch on today's printers to 106 with Photograde. This finer screen, along with our wider range of gray shades, allows the 2F and 2G to produce documents with both fine detail and natural gradients. Photograde is controlled by an ASIC that directs the laser to alter the size of dots to lead to more gray shades. The combination of fine print and photograde allow our two new printers to produce documents with print quality approaching that of much higher resolution printers costing thousands of dollars more. With the 2F and 2G, Print quality is so dramatically improved that it is no longer a barrier to creating effective documents. The LaserWriter 2F and 2G, the newest members of Apple's complete line of printers. From our printers designed for the individual, the ImageWriter 2, the StyleWriter, and the Personal LaserWriter LS, to our network printers, the Personal LaserWriter NT, and two new LaserWriters, the 2F and 2G. Printers designed for the 90s, to make it easy and fast to create effective, compelling documents. Documents guaranteed to make any reader sit up and take notice. Scanning is just too difficult. The output just doesn't look like the picture I scanned in. 16 shades of grade is just not enough for what I'm doing. The file's too big. It won't even fit on the floppy. The output looks very different on different printers. There is no consistency. I just spent too much time retouching the scanned pictures. 
What you just saw up there were six Apple employees in uh, pseudo roles uh, pretending to be real customers. But um, unfortunately, the problems that they talked about are indeed very, very real for anyone who's tried to scan a picture today. You practically need a PhD in imaging science, um, have to be a grand wizard at Adobe Photoshop just to get a decent looking picture into your document. And that's meant that most of us, and in fact most of our customers, don't scan today. So what we did on the scanner team was really set out to address all of these concerns, to eliminate all these problems, basically try to open up the world of images to all our users. And I get the privilege of showing you exactly what we've been able to do. <laughs> Someone out there is happy. So um, what I'm going to do is basically go through a demo and scan in this photograph and just show you exactly how easy everything is to choose from. So we'll just go ahead and choose um, the LaserWriter 2G, for example. Then you take the picture and very carefully slap it down in the middle of the scanner. <laughs> and then you hit this one button called Auto Scan. And from here, the program takes over and goes through a whole bunch of steps to automatically scan this picture for you. And I'll describe what's going on. The first thing it does is a pre-scan. This is a low resolution scan of the entire scanner bed to figure out a couple of things. First, it determines exactly where the picture is so it knows what area to scan for the final scan. Then it also looks at the picture and decides whether it's line art, just black and white, or whether it's a photograph with many shades of gray. And based on this information, line art or photograph, based on what printer you're scanning for, it chooses all of the right parameters for the final scan. As you can see, it correctly decided it was a photograph. And all these parameters include things like bit depth and resolution, uh, whether or not to half tone the picture for you. It also knows how to correct the picture, the shades of gray, so that it'll look right on your printer. For example, if you're going to a lino, which prints very dark, it will automatically lighten the picture. And if you're going to an image writer with a faded ribbon, it'll automatically darken the picture for you. And so it's used these parameters to get the picture into the system. Now, you can see that it's pretty crooked. I mean, I've exaggerated it, but if you ever scanned, you know this always happens. Basically, there are some elves that live inside scanners that do this for you. They're very handy at it. We decided to just get rid of the issue by automatically straightening the picture for you. You can see that happen, right? No? Maybe? There you go. Automatically straightens. And as a final step, we just get rid of all the extra white space around the picture. So what you're left with is the picture that you wanted to scan. And that's it, just one button scanning. <laughs> For all of the, the HyperCard users out there, we've also revved HyperScan to be much more useful. So between the new LaserWire 2F and 2G and the one scanner, expect that all of you and all your memos and everything will have wonderful pictures of our products in them.
searching. Some people have been a long time looking. Looking for a personal computer compatible with virtually any software. Computers that bridge the distance between desktops, between offices, between continents. Computers with greater power to enhance potential, remove limitations, explore new boundaries. Waiting for computers that find freedom through mobility. Some people have been a long time looking for computers like this. Little did they know they were already here. Apple is proud to announce the most significant expansion ever of the Macintosh family of personal computers. About the time we realized that the Classic was going to be a pretty popular product, uh, engineering started an investigation codenamed Apollo. And Apollo's goals were to take some early customer feedback from Classic customers and incorporate it in a new design, a second generation Classic, and bring that product to market very, very quickly. And to give you a flavor of what time to market means at Apple now, let me outline the Apollo uh, development schedule. Basically, engineering work started in earnest around November of 1990. And the product went into production in Singapore in July of 1991. That's eight months to production. This Monday, when we uh, unveil it to the public in Comdex, and here's the big moment, folks, over 100,000 Classic 2s will have rolled off the manufacturing lines in Singapore and in Cork, Ireland. So we will not have an availability problem this year. So I'll give you a little overview of the product and get on with this thing. Basically, the Classic 2 advances the original Classic in three ways. The first is in the area of performance. It uses a 16 megahertz 68,030 as its processor. That doubles the performance over the Classic. It's about the same level of performance as you would see on the Macintosh LC. And it will outperform most 386SX machines on the market. Of course, because it's an 030, it has full System 7 support, including virtual memory. This machine's a very robust System 7 machine. The second area is in RAM, closely related to System 7, and that is customers have been asking <laughs> for even more, more room to grow RAM and, and go beyond that 4 megabyte barrier you have on the Plus and the, cla and the Classic and the Mac SC. So they work with more sophisticated applications and multiple applications simultaneously. And finally, sound input. We've included a microphone on the Classic 2. Last fall, when we introduced uh, the Classic and the LC and the 2SI, uh, a, lot of, a small number of, of customers, but a vocal number uh, group of Classic customers uh, suggested that uh, perhaps we should have included the microphone on the original Classic. So we integrated that feature in the uh, second generation model. So that's it. It's an easy story. Here's how it fits into the product line. I want to emphasize that the current Classic does not go away. It stays in the product line, same price, same configurations, and will continue to attract lots and lots of new customers to Macintosh as a most affordable machine. And the Classic 2 just sort of builds upon that foundation, extends the capabilities, tries to keep the momentum going and dovetail off the success of the original Classic. We have it in two configurations, a 240 configuration with keyboard, mouse, microphone, system software, everything in the box, a very complete system, 1899 suggested retail in the US. For an 030 machine, not too bad. And then a 480 configuration at uh, 2399. I expect the, the 240 configuration to be right around $1,500 this fall. And, <clears throat> and this may be the best part of the whole story. Uh, there's a hardware upgrade for all those hundreds of thousands of classic customers uh, that we reached in the past year. The suggested retail price on that is going to be $699. Now, if you're familiar with how Apple prices upgrades, you'll, you'll realize that it's pretty aggressive, pretty accessible for all those classic customers. Just to put it into perspective, uh, this past spring, in Apple USA, the price of the SE to SE30 upgrade was lowered to a pretty compelling $999, and that doesn't include any memory. So we have a very uh, accessible upgrade here, a compelling growth path for all those classic folks. This is truly a wicked fast Macintosh. 
The Macintosh 2FX is a brand new design based on a number of new technologies and new architectures, some of which we're actually patenting, that provide a brand new level of performance, the highest level of performance ever in Macintosh computing. It's hard to believe that it was about a year and a half ago that we brought out the Macintosh 2FX. A lot of you folks probably saw the intro and probably since then heard me talk about the 2FX as being the highest performance, most expandable, most configurable Macintosh we ever built. Well, forget all that. Because these computers, the Macintosh Quadra 700 and the Quadra 900, are now the fastest, most expandable, and certainly the most configurable Macs that we've ever built. But more importantly, they're probably some of the fastest computers in the world because the Ingram Test Labs, the folks that test our machines versus DOS machines, and we certainly tested against 46 processors with 50 megahertz clocks using not dry stones, wet stones, and MIPS, but things that people do for a living, like Windows-based apps running Illustrator, PageMaker, Word, and Excel. We blow them away. So as of Monday, Quadra 700 and Quadra 900 are the fastest personal computers in the universe. It's just that simple. <laughs> now in about 15 minutes or so, the notebook guys are going to come out here and tell you about the importance of, of, of size and weight, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I want you to think of one thing. Big products are good products. <laughs> These are big products. The Macintosh Quadra 700, the desktop version. The Macintosh Quadra 900, the uh, desk side version. And check this out. We have. <laughs> We have the new Vesuvio 21-inch display running off this Quadra machine, running QuickTime. We have seven animations running at a single time on this display. It's absolutely excellent. We've been in this, this high performance game for a while. If you consider like the first Mac 2X, our first 030 machine, to be our first truly high-end machine, we've shipped nearly a million computers into that space. And as a result, we've talked to a lot of our customers, reg card surveys, phone surveys, all sorts of different ways to get information to us. And they've told us a variety of things, like they want their machines to be non-disruptive, yet forward thinking. They've got to fit into their environments today in a non-disruptive fashion, yet they're investing significant amounts of dollars so they can't become obsolete in a short period of time. They've got to grow over time. The Quadra products provide that level of extensibility. Certainly as faster disks and new bus cards come out, the machines will grow with the customers. Another challenge has been to include state-of-the-art technologies with Macintosh ease of use. One example is we built in Ethernet on both these machines. But it's got to be Ethernet that my mother can use, just like local talk. Now granted, mom's a power user. It's a genetic thing. But, uh, <laughs> but she's still got to be able to hook it up as fast and easy as she can do local talk. And we've done that. As these are the first two products in a Quadra family, the next generation products are going to have even more exciting technologies in them. And they'll all be as easy to use as anything we've done thus far. And perhaps one of the most difficult feats is to keep all this affordable. When we talk about pricing in a little bit, you'll get a sense for how aggressive we are about pricing these high-end machines. Because just catching up slowly with our competitors in the high-end DOS machines and the workstation companies aren't good enough. We're out there and we're going to steal some market share. Because these are going to have the best price performance of any Mac that we've done in a high-end before. We've broken up our technologies of this machine into four basic areas. CPU, graphics, network and communications, and then I.O., SCSI and Nubus. From a CPU standpoint, the processor is a 68040. An interesting way to look at it is if you take a 68030, the 68882 floating point chip, and combine with these two a cache card that we run of the 2CI, all this technology, all this performance, gets integrated down onto this one big old chip and runs about five times faster than a 2CI. So they've done a phenomenal job of integration and performance, and it forms the core of technology for these machines. But, but since they've done such a good job at the CPU, it freed up our design engineers to really hone in and balance the rest of the architecture, the graphics, networking, communications, and the other subsystems. So from a graphics standpoint, we have the most configurable and highest performance video subsystem than ever before. It's built right onto the logic board by plugging in video RAM sims, like DRAM, but they're video RAM. We can go from 1 to 32 bits per pixel. 
That's true color images on both these machines, standard out the shoot. And not only that, because it's video RAM and there's multiple banks of it and it's a really fast design, we get the highest level of onboard performance ever. It's actually up to 80% as fast as the 824 GC card, our new bus based accelerator. And it ships as standard in both these machines. So a whole new level of graphics performance, which I'll demonstrate in a second. The third component is networking. Of course, these are Macs, so they have local talk, because all Macs have local talk. But the big news is Ethernet. We've taken our e new bus solution, surface mounted it, put a pin on the back, a connector on the back that goes out to thin net coax, thick net coax, and 10 base T twisted pair. But that's not even the big news, because we support Ethernet DMA, a real fast way to provide communications from machine to machine without dropping many packets. And it's a full 32-bit wide Ethernet. We'll be the first personal computer vendor to ship full 32-bit wide Ethernet right on the motherboard. So it's extremely high performance and provides the best kind of, of, of um, overall network performance before. We're using these machines in workgroup environments back in uh, Valley Green 6 and in City Center 4. We back up our machines across Ethernet now for the first time. It's, it really works well. The fourth component is SCSI and Nubus. And what we've done here is by using our own in-house designs for ASICs, as well as some new controllers from our third parties, we've basically doubled the performance of Nubus and SCSI. And these are two areas that will grow over time as those technologies evolve, as faster disks come out, as Nubus 90 cards evolve, and different types of Nubus master cards that want to exploit the performance of our subsystem. Those customers will just take advantage of all those performance. So there's five basic components, CPU, graphics, networking and communications, SCSI, and Nubus all have been balanced very, very effectively to provide overall high performance that just can be realized across any number of applications that our customers do. The difference between these two machines is kind of like a matter of extremes. The desktop version having um, a set of configuration and then the, the 900 providing far more expandability on the base design. They're both based on 25 megahertz 68040. And from a DRAM standpoint, using four megabyte SIMs, we can go up to 20 megabytes on the 700 and up to 64 megabytes on a 900 because we have extra banks of DRAM. As soon as we qualify and finish testing the 16 megabyte SIMs and they become more readily available, this machine can go up to 68 megabytes and this one can go up to 256 megabytes of RAM. So <laughs> think about it, right? Throw out your hard disk, get a power conditioner and live on the edge, right? <laughs> it's the only way to go. Power computing at its best. So, <laughs> the, the video subsystem is identical for both machines and the support for all of our monitors from 12 inch mono in color right up to the 21 inch display is supported for both of these machines right out the box. And we, we survey our installed base and find out who uses what in Nubus and fully the largest percentage of usage was Ethernet and video. Well, we've surface mounted both of those concepts onto the logic boards of these machines. So with two or virtually four slots in this machine and five or virtually seven slots, we believe we have the, um, the new bus expansion pretty well covered. Sound in is as it has been, stereo, uh, mono sound in with stereo sound out. There's a new processor direct slot, it's an 040 connector, so third parties can plug cards in it, look right down at the 040 traces that go by and just accelerate their own um, specific designs faster than ever before. From a disk configuration, we have floppy only configurations right up to 400 megabyte drives. That'll be available in January. That's one of the really fast drives we were talking about. So you start to really take advantage of the, of the SCSI subsystem. Software for all these CPUs is 701. It's a point release of 7.0 just for new device support. And the big news is AOX 3.0, which we're really excited about, as it's going to provide not only device support for these machines, but the System 7 look and feel and a bunch of other features that our high-end customers are dying for. So we're looking forward to seeing that in the first calendar quarter. If we do a cutaway, a slice of the Quadra 900, there are a couple of other features that are important to talk about. First, it is without a doubt the most expandable, configurable SCSI subsystem ever designed into a Mac. At the top of the design, you can see there's room for four five and a quarter inch half height devices. The front two can be removable for like floppies or MOs or CD-ROMs, and we're heavily evangelizing these concepts through third parties. So when we intro, there'll be a number of removable devices available. The back bay can be used for either two half heights or one five and a quarter inch full height disk. HP is going to come out with a 1.3 gigabyte full height disk on intro day that will ship in this box. So lots of different configurations and options for SCSI. New bus cards not only go faster, but can be bigger because the design provides for up to two extra inches, and we can provide a lot more power to new bus. So we can have two 25 watt slot cards and, and three 15 watt cards because that big silver thing in the middle there is a power supply. It's 303 watts of power. <laughs> So you load up all the SCSI devices, load up new bus, hit the power key, lights dim, children scream, you know, it's... <laughs> but after that's all said and done, you're off and running, the most configurable machine. <laughs> For the first time ever, a Macintosh with a key. I know, it's modes of operation in the Macintosh. 
but it's a good, it's a good thing. I know, the heresy you say. It's really a good thing because what we have here is a three-position key, off and on, pretty intuitive as to what they do. We got those licked fast. It's the, <laughs> it's the third position which is most interesting. It's called secure. And when you're in the on position, you would launch an application like um, a network-based um, file serving ap um, application or some kind of high-end rendering or animation. And when you flip the key to the third position, Apple Desktop Bus goes away. So the keyboard and mouse are disconnected. In addition, the floppy drive is, is ignored to prevent unauthorized access. So the people in the federal government, the Fed subcontractors, and people that just want to park this machine in a corner and leave it unattended can do so and not worry about you know, people coming over and just borrowing things from their machine. So this is really a good thing. We, we expect to see a lot of interesting uses for that. Let's do some, let's do some demos. Let's do some demos. Get, get rid of, yeah, demos, demos. These are fast machines. I think like this. OK, on the, the screen on your right is this Macintosh 2FX. We're going to make it look slow. Um, the screen on your left is, it's still a good machine. Ooh, I like it still. Um, <laughs> but I really like these machines. Um, the machine on your left is a Quadra 700. They're approximately the same configuration. I'm going to have a couple demos here if I can get my ambidextrous mousing skills in shape. I'll launch an Illustrator file. And it launches and loads faster. Yes, OK, things are happening. We, um, we got this file from our friends at Mac User Magazine. It's a big wireframe of a disk drive. And then what we're going to do is render it. The demonstration here, the first part, actually, will show the kind of speed that the Quadra 700 can launch and load huge data files, as it should come up any second now. Yep. So what we'll do is we'll render that in a second. And over here, we'll just wait another second or two as the FX catches up. Now, here's the real demo. As we go in, and we have 24-bit enabled on both machines, you get a sense for the kind of performance that the Quadra machine can provide in a graphics sub standpoint over, say, the 2FX. This is using onboard video that's standard with every Quadra machine versus an 824 card, not the GC, because that's, that's an expensive accelerator. We're finished on the Quadra. This is the kind of stuff our customers do every day across the entire industry. Our high-end customers like to work in true color, but they've had to work in 8-bit and then preview at the end of the day or at the end of the hour in true color. Now, leave your frame buffer fully enabled, because it just doesn't matter. True color images work around every bit as fast as, as pseudo color images. And we're just about we're finished here. So you can get a sense for the performance increase of the graphics subsystem on these machines. The next demo is an interesting one. Watch this splash screen. You guys have probably seen this before. It's called Ray Dream Designer. And it's a bunch of guys in Mountain View who have put together a ray tracing application. And let me get this one going, because it'll take just a little while to start up. What I'm going to do is render that splash screen, actually, the one we just showed. Um, and I'm going to ray trace it, as it's going to start off here on this Macintosh 2FX. Over here, I have another version of Raydream Designer. Actually, it's called DreamNet. And it knows a couple of interesting things. First, that it's running on a 68040. So they've recompiled it, and it runs like five times faster than on a 2FX. But it also knows that these machines have Ethernet, and that they're connected together, and that you probably want to use as many machines as you can to compute uh, ray traced images, because it's such a CPU-intensive operation. So what I'll do is launch the application on the 700, and we'll see the splash screen here. But watch over here, because we're going to send a signal across the network, and we've launched it on the other machine. So now we have two machines just ready to render. And I'll go up and use the exact same commands I used on the other side. Find the model. There it is. Replace the old one. Now, the screen on the left, you'll see there's two different color squares, a yellow one representing the 900 and a gray one representing the 700 versus the 2FX, which has just this one gray square. What's happening is this ray tracing is being distributed across this network. This will go as fast, basically, as you have money to buy new hardware. Because <laughs> if there's four machines or eight machines, you get more colors. And guess what? That means you have more machines doing the same thing. Now, what this is showing is certainly kind of like high-end, nerdy, ray tracing, Mandelbrot calculations, all of that kind of stuff. But where it really hits the road, where the rubber hits the road in this area, is when this technology is made available to like huge spreadsheets. Like, all you folks are here, and guess what? Your computers are doing nothing. So the folks who were here in the first show could be back there burning up your CPU cycles. <laughs> and and that's, that's actually a good thing, OK? So um, what we're showing is just kind of like a tip of the iceberg for what we're going to see our application developers do over time. The Raydream guys are very forward thinking and very aggressive and jumping on this technology. And um, over time, we expect to see it done on uh, many more applications. So this rendering, you can see we're well ahead already. And believe me, the 040 is a win. But we don't have time to render this entire thing here. So if we can go back to the slides. Great. From a performance standpoint, let's get them all up there. The Mac 2CI to the 2FX was a good jump in performance, like one and a half times.
But now, with the Quadra products, we're introducing the biggest incremental jump in performance over the predecessor than ever before, actually since the Plus to the Mac 2. And all these products are staying in the price list. The CI, the FX, and the Quadra products are all in the price list. So we have an excellent range of high performance, mid-range to very high-end products um, across the entire line. Pricing on the Quadra 700, we're talking about aggressive, $63.99 gets you 4 megs of DRAM and an 80 megabyte hard disk in all the performance we were talking about. Compare that, if you will. With the Macintosh 2FX, when it came out 18 months ago, a 480 configuration with no video, no Ethernet, and about half the performance came out at $9,865. So we're getting pretty serious about this pricing. If you are a user of a 2CX or a 2CI, you're in luck because for $3,500, you can upgrade to a Quadra 700. And if you happen to be a CX customer, guess what? Your life is going to change because we're talking six to eight times the speed of what you normally do. So you're going to look at your machine in a completely different way. Um, and the Quadra 900 with a 4 megs of DRAM and a 160 megabyte hard disk comes in at $84.99. So we have an extremely aggressively priced set of products that are the fastest personal computers around. So we're really proud about this. Availability, we're on a vertical production ramp. Both Fremont and Cork are building these machines out. We've had no product, production snags, and we're looking real forward to providing all the machines people want at intro. The uh, 700 logic board upgrade and the 400 megabyte disk are going to be available in January. And as my little caveat says, we have no idea when demand is going to subside so we can make them available in the company store. We'll, f we'll find out over time. <laughs> OK, we'll tell them to build more. I don't know. <laughs> So um, when we take a look at what we've done with these machines, like the Raygym guys have demonstrated, we've clearly raised the bar for what our developers can shoot at. They can now assume the presence of a number of new technologies, performance levels, and techniques to really add value to their platform and add value to their software. The Raygym guys are just the first in a whole series of folks that are going to take advantage of this performance. Second, we've definitely provided a very well-balanced architecture across all five of the subsystems. No one is a performance laggard. You're not going to have to wait for Nubus or wait for SCSI because they've all been balanced very well, Probably, perhaps the best balance we've ever done on a machine. And from an integration standpoint, they're extremely highly integrated machines. We've brought in video and Ethernet on the logic board because our 2FX customers told us they very much wanted that. And since these are the first in a family, we expect to integrate a bunch of new technologies into the follow-on Quadra machines that will come out over the next couple of years. So these are more than just fast Macintoshes. These are the best balanced, highly integrated Macs we've ever designed. It's the kind of machine that our sales reps and resellers need to compete against the entire range of personal computers, from high-performance, high-clock-speed DOS machines, all the way up to and including entry-level workstations and servers. These are definitely the machines you want to use when Wicked Fast isn't fast enough. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hello and welcome. Today you're going to see a special behind the scenes look at Apple's product development process. The passion and painstaking attention that our engineers pour into every Macintosh product. All of these new products adhere to four guiding principles of research and development, which were set down early last year. These principles were the driving force behind the products we introduced last October and will continue to be at the forefront of all of our R&D efforts in the coming months. The first of these is to include customer input at the start of every product development effort. And this begins by asking, what do our customers want? We've heard our customers say that ease of use is important, but not at the expense of functionality and performance. In addition, we've learned that a non-disruptive computing path is a key, and that new products must be designed and manufactured with a view towards future growth. The second guiding principle is faster time to market. In the past, the product development cycle was 24 to 36 months. Today, we've reduced that to 9 to 12 months. And in the future, we'll bring new products and follow-on technologies to market with increasing speed. Our third R&D principle is to drive innovation at the lowest possible price point. Traditionally, innovative technologies have surfaced first at the high end and gradually filtered down into lower-cost products. Our goal is to bring the latest technologies directly into the mainstream. 
And finally, the fourth principle is to focus on miniaturization and mobility. Perhaps this is the most visible feature of the products that you're going to be seeing today. But it's important to keep in mind that as miniature and as mobile as the power books appear, this is only the beginning. We're keenly interested in making personal computing technology that people can take with them anywhere. And most important, the power books that you'll see today are emblematic of all the R&D principles. They are more than just new notebook offerings for the industry. What we're seeing is a highly refined product line which will make Apple immediately competitive and serve as a point of departure for the future. In some cases, we've looked outside of our company to bring the best technology to the market in a timely way. And in fact, at a more general level, this represents a significant trend that is shaping the industry of the future. That is, the increasingly important role that alliances play in the research, development, and manufacturing of personal computing technology. As most of the main players in our industry are realizing, it's no longer possible to go it alone. The best way to produce great personal computing technology is to pull together the best minds, the brightest engineers, and the richest resources in the industry. The passion and intensity generated by this collective commitment will not only produce the highest quality product, but it will be what drives this industry forward. These products encapsulate the engineering team's commitment to creating the highest quality personal computing products for today and for the future. I think you'll find them as exciting as I do. People seem to think products are just hatched, you know, they just shoot out of the factory. Um, somebody just uh, pushed a button and there it was. The amazing thing to me is that people don't know of the industrial design profession, but they're affected by it constantly. The way it looks, the way it feels, the way you work with it, um, what customers are looking for, you know, from the business perspective, all those things are very important. Our group was responsible for the actual project management from the standpoint of cost, functionality. We were responsible for the actual hardware design of the logic board for the ASICs as well as the system integration of the logic board. We were also responsible for the hardware associated with the display, the input devices, the battery subsystem and so on. Ergonomics is the science of common sense, but a lot of people developing products forget that. product design guys always looking at the hardware guys. We kind of lean on each other. We even co-locate all the sub-assembly engineering teams um, to work in the same areas. Every little surface, every little bit, every little corner we've defined and looked at and evaluated from the latch, the way the latch feels, the way you open it up, the battery door, how it stays with the battery, how the battery slides out, everything's been looked at very closely. Should we make the unit thinner or, or thicker, or should we, um, should we try to pull more weight out of the, out of the box and, and have a pointing device as, as a uh, standalone option or through an ADB port? What should the battery capacity be? What is the software impact of the battery technology that we're using? Uh, what about brightness control in terms of how much power are we going to allocate to the bulb so that we give enough brightness to the, to the end user? Those types of decisions are an optimization of product marketing input, hardware design, as well as industrial design, talking through um, the various value engineering trade-offs of size, weight, cost, schedule, and, and so on. What we usually do early on the process is we'll have foam blocks made up to represent these components. And we essentially do a puzzle game, um, sort of playing with the um, engineering constraints balanced against the physical reality, which is how big it is, how it looks, how easy it is to deal with. It was clear to us that we didn't want to burden the user with an external input device, i.e. a mouse. The device we selected was a trackball. One option came up was at the right side of the product. Um, which made some sense from a configuration point of view, but as we looked at it from the user perspective, we decided it wasn't appropriate to overlook the left-handers of the world once again. Then we looked at 
putting it in the front and seemed like centered seemed to make sense. You know, a lot of times as a designer, when you approach something and you hit a wall, you say, let me look at this completely backwards, do something completely different. And something that came out of that um, made a lot of sense to us, and that was pushing the keyboard towards the back and moving hardware, and specifically the battery and the hard drive, forward. And what that ended up giving us was this very tight package that fit the trackball into the uh, footprint we were looking for, and then place the keyboard here. And that also gives us this palm rest that allows you to sort of take your desk with you. At first, we all looked at it and thought, that seems pretty radical. We became very excited that we finally figured this thing out that had been bugging us for months. Maybe not so much one, one huge Eureka, but uh, maybe more along the lines of, of a lot of small victories um, along the way. With all of our designs, what we try to do is not look at them as end products. We try to constantly use those, use those designs and, and enhance them. And what we really want to look for is scalability for the future. We um, are are road mapping the critical technologies that are important to, to portables. For instance, flat panel display technology, battery technology, mass storage devices, both floppy as well as uh, rigid media, as well as solid state um, capability. Um, if you take a look at, at the overall hardware architecture of the microprocessor and, and the key um, uh, uh, I.O. level of functionality, um, we have all of that road mapped um, for uh, the next three to four years. We'll continue to ride the commodity items of batteries, of, of input devices, of displays, and floppy drives, and so on. We'll ride those commodity curves. If we push the, the industry in every, every single sub-assembly, we would never deliver product uh, to the market. Uh, we have a very good relationship with Sony, and they understand how we do business. They had uh, the infrastructure in place, which we needed, uh, to, so that we could deliver the, the product concept and product ideas that, that we had developed here. We have partnered with them, and what we have done is we've brought to, brought, brought to the table a, an overall uh, design concept, both from the hardware, software, as well as the industrial design and product design piece. And what Sony has brought to the, brought to the table is a, is a complete design engineering team that has complemented our, our, our product ideas uh, as well as provided with the, the manufacturing um, capability and service capability as well um, to support us. Uh, one thing that people notice right off that's different is the color. Uh, it's not our uh, traditional um, Apple Platinum. We did that for a couple reasons. One, from a functional point of view, uh, these products are handled a lot. They tend to show dirt, so we went to a, a darker value, obviously, to hide that and so that they look uh, fresh and new all the time. The darker colors did say to people, this is a, a richer thing. It's more of a personal item. In the desktop mode, some inclination on the product is real important. But in the laptop mode, you want it to remain flat. So we came up with this wheel idea. It's, the reason it's round is it tells you that you have to rotate it to open it. And when you do, you'll notice as you rotate around, the little foot slides out and, and creates the angle necessary to, to, for the desktop use. When you're ready to go, you simply flip it back up into place. It retracts, and it's out of the way and, and ready to go. We've located the icons on the top. You don't get up and get around behind the product to look at the back. You, you look at the top of the product, you see, oh, yeah, there's my icon, and it matches up with what's on the connector in the same orientation. We're doing some new things here that people haven't done before. And when you think about what you could possibly do in the future with, with a portable notebook uh, that has Macintosh functionality uh, as, 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 uh, at the heart of it, um, it, it's just extremely exciting. And we're giving uh, a customer uh, or an individual the capability of a, of a Macintosh 2CI in something in six and a half pounds.
here we have it. This is the uh, carrying case extended edition. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Um, you may want to know that we do have plenty of those extended edition carrying cases available in the company store. And in fact, uh, Frank is looking at bundling those with his Quadra. So look, look for that in the store near you. Uh, on Monday, we're finally going to get to uh, announce these great new power books. Uh, it's also going to be great because uh, I finally get to do a little bit of my laundry that's been piling up there. <laughs> uh, we have three products in our PowerBook family. The PowerBook 100, 140, and 170 really spans the line between affordability and performance. It really gives our customers a choice to decide which product is mo most appropriate for their use and their budget. So let's go into a little bit of detail about the products. Great, so looking at the processor with the PowerBook 100, it's a 68,000 at 16 megahertz. That's roughly uh, the classic two performance. The PowerBook 140 is an 030 at 16 megahertz. That's 2CX performance. And at the 2CI level, the PowerBook 170, 030, 25 megahertz with an FPU, the 882. In terms of RAM, uh, all systems are expandable up to 8. The minimum configuration on the 100 and the 140 is 2 megabytes. And then on the 170, the minimum configuration is 4 megabytes. We'll be offering a 20 megabyte hard disk and a 40 megabyte hard disk uh, in the line, as you can see up there. As well, as Bruce mentioned, we're, we're introducing a line of products. So that means with the floppy drive, for example, we can give the uh, customers choices. So with the PowerBook 100, we, uh, they have the choice of an external floppy drive. So they can take advantage of the smaller size and weight of the 100 and leave the floppy drive at their hotel room or back at their office. If they prefer an internal floppy drive, then they have the PowerBook 140 and 170 to choose from. Um, also, we have the, uh, a full complement of ports. We have built-in SCSI and built-in networking, both of which distinguish these power books from any other notebook on the market today, um, as well as we have sound in uh, on the PowerBook 140 and 170, sound out on all three products. Uh, we have an internal modem, uh, 2400 baud, 9600 baud data modem. Uh, it's going to be bundled in the U.S. on the PowerBook 170. So as you can see, a lot of the functionality that you uh, associate with Macintosh desktops are now in these notebooks that is sub seven pound uh, machines. So a lot of achievements there. And we got these machines down to the true notebook size. So the PowerBook 100, eight and a half by 11 by 1.8 inch, inches thick, weighs 5.1 pounds. The PowerBook 140 and 170 share the same plastic, slightly larger, right around 6.8 6 pounds. So. Uh, But to get to this small size, you can't just take the Macintosh portable today and sort of stick it in the incredible shrinking machine and get it down to you know, six or seven pounds. It's really a lot of long, hard work across the entire system. So let's take a look at some of the components. OK, let's start with keyboards. And this is the keyboard for the uh, original Macintosh portable we introduced in 1989. And, and for the PowerBooks, Bruce? Yeah, here's our, here's our new keyboard. As you can see, it's much thinner, saves about a half inch in height and saves about three quarters of a pound. So uh, quite a bit of savings just in a dang keyboard. <laughs> RAM card. This is a one megabyte RAM card that uh, works with the uh, Macintosh portable. And here's the RAM expansion card for <laughs> the <laughs> so, so that's going to be in two and four megabyte configurations on this card. And the, whoa. This, uh, this beefy guy is the uh, rechargeable battery for the Macintosh Portable. And here we have the new, uh, the new battery for the PowerBooks. It's a nice get, uh, cartridge style. Gives you two to three hours of battery life, so improvements here. OK, great. And uh, you know, Bruce, I'm kind of slow, but I'm noticing a trend here. Why do I always get all the big components? That's, that's because you're the big, strong guy here. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so this is a 40 megabyte hard disk uh, that went with the Macintosh Portable. And right here, this is our new form factor, <laughs> two and a half inch uh, hard disk. So this will be in 20 and 40 megabyte configurations. And finally, the logic board of the Macintosh Portable. And here we have it for the PowerBook 170. You can see, <laughs> you can see the difference. I, Again, 2CI performance. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is bring out the machines, right? Sounds good to me. So one of the things that customers always say is, can it fit in a briefcase? Uh, thank you, Vanna. 
<laughs> sure, Pat. <laughs> uh, so here we do. Here we go. Let's open it up. Frank didn't lock it, did he? No. <laughs> here we go. And you can see it fits in sideways in the briefcase. This is a briefcase that I got as a graduation present from high school and I've never had a use for it till now. <laughs> so, so. And then we have the PowerBook 140 and uh, where's Wayne? Back here, Bruce, just rolling. I got a personal laser rider, as you can see, and also as you can see on the overhead, uh, the PowerBook 100 is eight and a half by 11, so there's some commonality here. And that's in the paper tray, which, is, which, contains, which contains the PowerBook 100. So uh, Frank, eat your heart out. So, so it's eight and a half by eleven by what's the? Uh, it must be about two hundred fifty sheets. I Something like that. It. Okay, great. Don't don't try that at home. That's yeah. a specially modified printer, so it's not. The... Okay, so just to get this straight. So we got it down to the notebook size, sort of leading edge in terms of size and weight. But we have to figure out how do you do a pointing device. So it's always fun to first look at the competition and see how they do it. So what we have here is sort of your uh, sort of a standard DOS notebook computer with your what do you call this? I think you call this sort of like the Microsoft uh, jump rope. <laughs> well, I've got something over here, Bruce. It's not quite as aerobic as what you have there, but uh, still no less uh, attractive. Um, I don't know. What, what, do you call, what do you call this? Bruce? I think like the Microsoft wart. The wart, OK. The wart. So, Bruce has a knack for, for product names. So th we've got this wart here on the side. And what happens when, when you try to close the case, many people want to put these notebooks in their briefcase, is uh, you'll be able to get uh, all kinds of things in them, like leaded pencils and paper clips, small insects, I don't know, what, whatever in there. And it's going to cause reliability problems for your, uh, for your notebook. As well here, you've got this knob on the back that can break off as you put it in. So a lot of problems initially just as, as you look at it. Also, when we open it up, you'll notice with, this is a characteristic of all DOS notebooks that the keyboard is pushed to the front. So as you use it, and you go ahead and type here, when you use it for any short period of time, your arm will naturally rest in, on either the tabletop or the laptop, depending on how you're working, and you're working in this kind of a position. And your tendons, are, in this position, your tendons and your wrist are tight. Uh, increases the probability of tendonitis or carpal tunnel syndrome, as, as you may have heard. So some definite problems uh, with, with both designs. What we've done, let's show you right now, is taken a very different uh, approach. We knew we wanted a, a, a pointing device from, from the beginning, and so we integrated it into the di design of the machine, and so now we have a complete design. Um, you notice here that the keyboard, first of all, is pushed back. The trackball is in the center. That leaves room for some palm rests. I can set my palms here, go ahead and type. On the, uh, on the keyboard, and you can notice my wrist is straight. It's what we call in a neutral position, which is a very good ergonomic position. I could then use my, with my finger still on the keyboard, I can use uh, my thumb to control the trackball, and then with my other hand, I can control this button, which is the mouse button, or I can move down, use my index finger or middle finger, and then use the same button, their dual, dual button control, use this button to control the, uh, the mouse. So it's both for right-handed and left-handed people. Um, as well as the, since the keyboard is, yeah, it's a really hot design. As well, the keyboard is pushed back, so if I use it in my lap, unlike DOS computers where I would be crunched in here, I have plenty of room to type and work in a, uh, in a, in a small area. So a lot of advantages there. Th this is a design that many of you participated in, in the overall testing of this. So you helped evolve this design, and th thank you very much for that. Uh, one of the other things that came out of the user testing was these little lifters here that provide some angle on the keyboard when you're using it on the desktop. So a very nice, uh, uh, complete design. Uh, now going on to displays. On the PowerBook 170, we have a backlit active matrix display. This display is the fastest, the brightest, the highest contrast, widest viewing angle display uh, out there. So it's by far the premier display technology available on uh, notebook computers. Uh, then on the PowerBook 100 and 140, we use super twist displays. These are state-of-the-art displays, better than, the, better than the best that are out there on any other notebooks. So we have a great story on the displays and the, in, in the ergonomics with the PowerBooks. Great. So as you can see, we've got a great uh, ergonomic story as well. We have uh, advantages in networking. With built-in networking on all three products, built-in local talk, 
and file sharing, uh, which is a standard feature of 7.0, which all these products will ship with 7.0, we can turn our, any one of the PowerBooks, I'll, do, I'll work with the PowerBook 100, we can turn that into a server and easily connect to the Macintosh desktop. So let's do that right now. Bruce, can you give me a hand? Yeah, right here. So, let's make sure. Okay. There's no nothing, wires. No attached. wires. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no tricks. No tricks. No tricks. You can try this at home. And I'll connect back uh, in there. So I've just got a standard local talk cable. I've got the alias uh, to the PowerBook 100. And I'll just double click on the alias and type my password in. Does it work? And here I am. All the contents, and this is quite easy to use, all the contents of my PowerBook 100 hard disk available to me on my desktop. We, we show this to customers, and they are extremely excited about this about this capability given the fact that many of the notebooks are second machine users, are second machines, so they can bring the, uh, the PowerBooks easily into their office and connect with their desktop. Customers though, you may, you may be surprised, but a number of our customers also own DOS machines, it's true, and, and we need to help them um, at least make some kind of productive <coughs> use of these machines for things other than boat anchors. So. Uh, we're trying to do that, and with the help of Fairlawn, uh, which I have a, uh, they have a PhoneNet Talk PC product. We have a PhoneNet Talk PC card in here, as well as the software. We can essentially connect our PowerBook 100, 140, or 170 to the DOS desktop, just as I did, just as I showed you with the Mac. So a great connectivity, a great uh, networking story with both the DOS desktop and our Mac desktop. Great, but but we know that sometimes our People using notebook computers are going to want to have access to those network services, but it's a portable, so they aren't going to be at their desktop. They aren't, they aren't going to have the, this, uh, this network connection through the, uh, through the standard connections there. And so we have a brand new product. This is a really cool demo. Let's begin this. This is our a new product, Apple Talk Remote Access. It's one of our new networking communication products out there. Can you hear it dialing? It's using inter the internal modem here. And so what we're doing is connecting this Macintosh through the standard telephone lines to another Macintosh that's over my desktop over in Valley Green 6 that has a modem attached. So it communicates that, establishes the connection, and when, once it answers and, and gets there, I have full access to the network. And it could do anything as if I was a, a local member of the network. This product was announced this last week at NetWorld with, along with Apple Share 3.0. So this, uh, these products are really important for how these notebook users are, want to use their computers. In fact, it's a, it's a product that's available for $199, but it's so important for people who are using notebooks that we're bundling the software with all three PowerBooks. <laughs> to show you that I'm not cheating here, uh, let's go to the chooser, and you can see that there's really no networks there and boom, they disappeared. So I've established a connection there. So I have access to all my zones, just as I was, if I was local there. Uh, what else can I do? I could do things like go to the Apple directory, and here it is, it shows up here. This would be nice to do when I want to call Randy, our uh, vice president, and say thanks, Randy, for uh, helping us create these new pro pro great products. Uh, another great thing that you could do that uh, I'm personally very happy to do is because I'm a pretty forgetful type of person sometimes. And when you're on the road, uh, you want to have access to your hard disk. So what I'm running right now is using, uh, I have Macintosh file sharing running on my, my desktop computer. And so uh, in just a few seconds, what will appear is entire contents of my hard disk. So I could just go over there, bring back a file back and forth. Re you know, a really important uh, functionality. We show this to customers and their jaws sort of drop. They're going like, wow, I didn't, even, you know, I didn't know you could do this, that type of thing. So again, it, it, it'll show up in just, just a second. And there, Bruce, how are you getting the video out uh, onto the screen? Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Uh, I'm, using, <laughs> I, I'm using a radius power view. So we've been working with lots of third parties and doing products for uh, add-ons for the PowerBooks. And so one of the, these products is the radius power view. There are a few other companies doing video out, RAM, and uh, other accessories for the product, so it uh, really helps us out here. Great, so you can see we've got advantages in, in ergonomics, networking, communication, and based on the early feedback that we've received from the customers, there's going to be a whole heck of a lot of demand for these products for the foreseeable future. But we're leaving nothing to doubt because we're going to price these products very aggressively. You can see the pricing here. 
Uh, we've got a full range from the Macintosh uh, PowerBook 100, the base configuration, the 220 at 2299, all the way up to the 170, the 440 with the modem bundle at 4599. So a good offering there, as well as a full complement of peripherals, uh, fax modems, uh, SCSI cables, RAM cards, batteries, etc.